Hello and welcome to the session in which we would look at goodwill impairment. This topic is covered in intermediate accounting and advanced accounting as well as the CPA exam. So it's very important whether you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate to understand how goodwill and goodwill impairment works. Now at this point I'm assuming you, are, you know what goodwill is although I'm going to go over brief overview how to compute goodwill initially. Now if you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate I strongly suggest you take a look at my website farhatlectures.com. I don't replace your CPA review course. I am a useful addition, alternative explanation, backup explanation that's going to help you understand the material better. And by doing so, you'll be able to understand your CPA review better. And my courses are aligned with your CPA review course, which in turn, you'll be able to pass your exam. Now, your risk with me is one month of subscription. You can try it. If you like it, you keep the subscription. If not, you cancel. Your potential gain is passing the exam. And if not for anything, take a look at my website to find out how well or not well your university doing on the CPA exam and the list of other courses that I teach. If you have not connected with me on LinkedIn, please do so and take a look at my take a look at my LinkedIn recommendation, like this recording, share it with other, connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. So let's talk about Goodwill. How is goodwill created? For example, uh, when you when one company purchases another company, goodwill is created. How so? Let's assume you're buying a company and they have a fair value of their assets is 100,000. That's the fair value of their assets. The fair value of their liabilities is 60, just for the sake of illustration. So the fair value of their book value is 40,000. Now let's assume you paid you paid $75,000 for this company. You paid $75,000 for something that's worth $40,000. So you paid an excess of $25,000. And to make this simple, we're going to assume you could not find any identifiable asset to allocate this $25,000, whether it's tangible or intangible. So if you cannot allocate this $25,000 to any asset or liability sometime, what you need to do, the remaining will be goodwill so goodwill is created when one company purchase another company in access of their fair market value and that access first will have to be allocated to identifiable tangible or intangible asset if not any remaining goes to goodwill now this twenty five thousand sits on the books but what do we have to do with it well the first thing we do is we we're gonna we're gonna consider it that it has indefinite life and this is important when we're dealing with goodwill and intangibles, it's very important to know that if something has an indefinite life. Indefinite life means we don't do any amortization. If we don't do any no amortization, what we do is we do impairment. So we have to check for to see if the value of that asset went down. So there is no rationale about there's no need for this rationale and systematic manner reduction like in depreciation on amortization so we don't amortize we don't depreciate what we do is we're going to impair and goodwill impairment the loss itself is basically an operating item it goes on the income statement as one line of losses then we perform this goodwill based on what's called the reporting unit and we're going to talk about the reporting unit a little bit more detail within a combined entity so we would look at the reporting unit and we will test for impairment on that reporting unit so each reporting unit is will be separately subject to that periodic impairment review and what's that periodic usually annually sometime we do it more than annually if circumstances arise but usually at least annually we have to do this impairment we have to check to see is our reporting unit impaired now how do we how do we say we have a reporting unit that's important what what is reporting unit or units okay what is what is that reporting unit first of all it has to be it has its own operating line it's distinct operating line so it's basically a separate business and that separate business has to be responsible for its assets liabilities and earn its own profit the unit itself, it's, it's part of the company, but it, it's accounted for separately and it reports earning to top management for support and decision making. So simply put, it's like an independent unit within the overall entity. We call this a report reporting unit. And what we do is we test the reporting unit, uh, the goodwill for that reporting unit. OK, so following the business combination, we have identifiable assets and liabilities that are assigned to that reporting unit. So we have those. So any amount assigned to goodwill expected to benefit from the synergies of the combination. So we have a goodwill for that reporting unit specifically. 
Okay, so any individual reporting unit where goodwill resides is the appropriate level for goodwill impairment testing. So when we buy a company and we have a reporting unit A, B, C, well, we're going to have goodwill for A, goodwill for B, and goodwill for C. Each one will have their own assets, their own liabilities, and their own unit. And to show you a real example, let's take a look at AT&T. AT&T identify its principal operating unit or one level below them as a reporting unit. And let's take a look at their a script of their annual report. Goodwill is tested by comparing the book value, and we're going to talk about this later, of each reporting unit deemed to be our principal operating segment to one level below them. And these are the operating unit, business solutions, entertainment group, consumer mobility, Mexico, wireless, Brazil, and Pan America, and the international market at the fair value. So we compare the book value to the fair value, and they use discounted cash flow as well as market multiple approach. This is the way that they do the impairment. We'll discuss this shortly. Okay. So notice, all goodwill impairment testing is performed at the reporting units. What they do is they look at the Mexican unit separately, Mexican wireless, and they would compare the, the book value to the fair value. And what do they use when they do so? Well, the book value is the balance sheet. The fair value, they use either discounted cash flow or they might take a look at market multiple. Basically, how much would the market value that reporting unit today in the actual market based on some multiple? Okay. And this is what, what happens is when you, when you look at each reporting unit separately, okay, what's that going to do? It's not going to mask. So, for example, if entertainment groups go goodwill went down and consumer mobility went up, if you combine them, they will cancel each other. You don't want to do that. So you want to report each one separately so not one of them will mask the other, mask the decrease in the other. Okay? So one goes up, the other goes down. They cancel each other out. You don't want to do that. If one goes down... You will account for that separately. Now, what do you do? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you find out? How do you start this whole process? Well, impairment testing can be very costly. Therefore, it's, well, although it's yearly, but, you know, to do the impairment testing itself using numbers, it's costly. So what FASB, what, what FASB recommended is you can do what's called qualitative analysis to assess whether testing procedures are appropriate. So you, you don't start the testing immediately because it's costly, because you have to do cash flow analysis, you have to collect data. So you do what's called qualitative analysis. Now, what are the qualitative analysis? There are many factors that will tell you whether to do, to perform impairment testing. Well, what are those factors? I'm going to show you a list. This is not the complete list. You can think of other lists. One is macroeconomic conditions. Like what? General economic conditions. Like uh, the, the economy is contracting. There's a foreign currency fluctuation where you are exposed to that foreign currency. There's a, a decrease in credit market. Something happened in the macroeconomic condition that affect your company. Maybe, maybe you want to take a look at that reporting unit. Maybe it lost some value. Industry and market consideration. This could be deteriorate, deteriorate and the environment in which you operate. For example, during the real estate crisis, if you are, uh, if you, if your company deals with real estate, if it's exposed to the real estate, there's a deterioration in your markets. You want to take a look at your goodwill to see if it's impaired. Or there's an increase in competitive environment. You have new companies that are coming onto the market that are better and they provide better service at a lower cost than you. A decline in the market dependent multiple of matrices, both as an absolute and relative value. And this could take many, uh, those mat matrices, uh, matrices could take any value, like the stock market, maybe your stock price went down in either an absolute or relative relative to the pairs. And change in the market or an entity product or services. There's a major change in your product that's no longer useful or a regulatory or political development. Or guess what? Let's assume it's 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 a medication. The FDA says, take it out. It's dangerous. You know, then what's going to happen? That reporting unit might, the goodwill of that reporting unit might be impaired. So those are qualitative tests. It's basically looking for events that trigger that, you know, do I have... Do I have a goodwill impairment? Those are the events that you look for. Cost factor, if the cost if the cost that goes into your product went up, like raw material, labor, there's a shortage, could have a negative effect on earning. Well, your company might be, your reporting unit might be impaired. Other financial performance, like negative or declining cash flow, and this is on the CPA exam, they, they always tell you negative, negative or declining cash flow, it's really a red flag for goodwill and testing for goodwill impairment or a decline in the actual or, or planned revenue earning. So if you have a unit and it's not going to be generating revenue in the future, guess what? 
it might be impaired. It, when, then, then what? If they have a goodwill, guess what? If that's had goodwill, test the goodwill for impairment. And we're going to see how do we do that in a moment. Changes in management sometime. Let's assume Elon Musk leaves Tesla. Who knows? Maybe Tesla tanks. It's like, you know what? Uh, maybe it's if they have any goodwill, uh, uh, they have to maybe test that goodwill. Key personnel, strategy, or customers. Um, any event could trigger goodwill. Now, this event, it has to be more likely than not. Now, how do you define more likely than not? It's 50% plus. So if the reporting fair value unit is deemed to be greater than, than the carrying amount, if there's more than 50% chance that the fair value is greater, then you don't do anything. You just say, okay, no further impairment tests are necessary. But if the reporting unit, fair value, so we'd look, we would compare fair value versus book value. If the fair value is less than we think, we think it's less than the book value, 50% plus a chance, then what we do, we have to do further testing. Now, again, we do this annually, but remember, we don't have to wait annually. For example, when COVID hit in March of 2020, or, you know, March or February, it doesn't matter. What happened is then if you purchase some businesses recently, you have to test them for if there's any goodwill impairment okay, because businesses are going down. Okay, so you don't have to wait yearly. More frequent impairment assessment is required if events or circumstances change that make it more likely than not that the reporting unit fair value is now below the carrying value. So it doesn't have to be annually, but at least annually. But if something happened before it's annually, then you will do it. Let's take a look at an example. Assume on January 1st, 2022, investors from Nucol Corporation cons to consolidate the telecommunication operation of DSM and Vision Talks in a deal that's worth $2.2 So those two companies consolidate DSM and Vision Talk. Nucol uh, organizes each former firm as an operating unit and recognizes $215 million as goodwill at the merger date. Then allocate this amount to three different units. So what they did, they said, well, our total goodwill is 215 and they have three reporting units, DSM Wire, DSM Wireless, and Vision Talks. And what they do, they allocated this $215 million to those three units, $22 million for DSM, $150 to DSL Wired, a wireless 155 and vision talk 38 million now at the end of the year what they have to do they have to examine any relevant event what i showed you earlier in the prior slide and circumstances to determine the fair value of the reporting unit okay what did the analysis revealed well it revealed that the fair value of each reporting unit likely exceeds its carrying amount except for this dsm wireless this dsm wireless it seems that they have a difficulty realizing expected cost savings synergies with Vision Talk. So what they did, they assumed DSS, DSM wireless when they first merged, that because of that merger, they're going to save cost. At the end of the year, they find out this saving cost did not really materialize. It means our cost went up. Guess what? More likely than not that this reporting unit is subject to goodwill impairment. Now, we're going to have to look at this unit separately. The other two, they're good. DSM Wired is good. Vision Talks is good. Why? Because the fair value at the end of the year is greater than the book value. This one, fair value, greater than the book value. I don't have to do anything. Now, we must proceed with the impairment testing. So, let's do the impairment testing. Okay. Now, we compute the impairment testing and we find out the fair value is 650. The carrying amount is 720, the book value carrying amount. What happened is the difference between them is 70 million, 70 million. The difference between them is 70 million. Okay, what, what does that mean? Well, we have 155 of goodwill impairment, and now we're going to, uh, goodwill, we're going to have to reduce it by 70 million. So we're going to take the 70 million and report 70 million of impairment loss as on a separate line, in the operating section, it's basically businesses buy other businesses, and as a result, they have goodwill. As a result, that goodwill could be impaired. It's a regular loss. It's an impairment loss. It's not unusual or anything, okay? As of December 31st, 2022, Nucol reports only 85 million of goodwill. Remember, there were 155. They have to subtract 70 because we're going to debit a loss, impairment loss credit, Goodwill for 85, for 70 million. That's the entry, impairment loss. Impairment loss credit goodwill. Therefore, we reduce the goodwill by 70 million. The other two units, they're good. 
we don't have to do anything. Now, we also have to do additional disclosure, uh, such as facts and circumstances to why we did this impairment. The method that we use to determine the fair value, remember the fair value was 650. How did we come up with fair value? Did we use discounted cash flow? Did we use uh, market multiple? Okay, what did we do? Did we compare DSM wireless to some other business that's compared to us? Okay, now bear in mind, impairment loss cannot exceed the carrying amount of any particular reporting units goodwill. So simply put, let's assume we find out that goodwill impairment loss is 160 million. Well, guess what? We can only take 155. It cannot exceed that. So this is basically a summary of goodwill impairment. Once again, at the end of this recording, I'm going to remind you that your study for your CPA exam once in your lifetime. You pass it, you move on with your life. Don't shortchange yourself. I don't replace your CPA review course. I'm a useful addition. Give me a try. Study hard for the CPA exam. It's worth it. It's you pay you pay for it once. It's going to pay dividend for the next 30 to 40 years. Good luck. Study hard. And of course, stay safe.